अच्छा लगे आपकी टू पी टी चलता है मैं कर देता हूँ वही है नहीं नहीं एक और है दूसरे कैंडिडेट्स का है इस नाम से One minute, one minute, one minute, one minute. एक बार आप बता दीजिए। Yes। आपका कौन सा है? The first one। ये। Twenty fifteen से thirty था ना? Sequence डाल दीजिए। And uh, chair of this session is uh, Dr. Patnaik from Bhopal. My name is Suprabha Patnaik. Uh, I'm the principal advisor in uh, 
Atal Bihari Vajpayee Institute of Good Governance and Policy Analysis. Uh, I'm glad to be here with you today. Thank you. Yeah. Fair enough, fair enough. Um, but we'll do some uh, prelim talks so that yeah, we get started. With. So just for the uh, sake of everyone out here, it'll be nicer if uh, you know we could spell out the sequence of topics and people who are going to speak uh, this morning. <coughs> uh, we have number one, uh, Ms. Bharti Daya, uh, followed by Ms. Alka Bihari, and then uh, Ms. Diksha Mohan, Mr. Chandra Pratap Singh, Mr. Rahul Chopra, Ms. Pooja Shri, Ms. Pooja, Ms. Tanushri, Ms. Smita Varnekar, uh, Ms. Vibha Sahu, Manjari Upreti, Shalini, Arun Kumar, uh, Mr. Palash Naya, and Vani Bharadwaj. We also have Ms. Seema Purohit, who's come into this session from a different session at the moment. While we wait for the third uh, jury member, I think it would be nicer to let all of you know that we have a long list of speakers. Time at our disposal is too little, hence uh, we would request each of you uh, to cooperate and restrict your uh, presentation to four to five minutes. Five on the max, uh, five, um, uh, four of course on the minimum side. And we'll certainly uh, raise our first bell at four minutes. So please, uh, please get yourself prepared accordingly so that I mean, it, it is for everybody's benefit. Uh, we have uh, an hour and a half, but 16 into four precepts. Then we'll have, a l we'll have much more time for more discussions and for us to plan accordingly. So shall we? Shall we? Fair enough, fair enough. Thank you so much. So uh, on uh, behalf of uh, Mobius Foundation, all the organizers of this conference, May I now invite uh, Ms. Bharti Dhaya to come and make her presentation. A critical understanding of nature-based solutions and its relevance in climate change education in uh, Indian schools, I guess, in urban schools. Right, sorry. Please go ahead. All the best. OK, thank you. Hello. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Bharti Dhaya. Presently, I'm a doctoral student in School of Educational Studies, this Hyderabad. So my work is based on uh, sustainability education and how to strengthen this concept of sustainability in schools, uh, school education. So the uh, present paper uh, will try to have a critical understanding of nature-based solutions and its relevance in climate change education in urban areas. So today's agenda will be, uh, we'll start with some uh, context uh, building and about NBS, we'll focus on the different uh, definitions actions and benefits and drawbacks of NBS, and NBS, uh, the need of NBS in schools, and the case study as a, uh, as a pilot study in European schools, coming with the conclusion and the references. So the introduction, we know that climate change is the new reality of contemporary world, especially if you look at urban spaces. Uh, so according to Global Climate Risk Index 2021, India holds seventh place in impacts of climate change disasters. Also, it is under like fifth top, top five nations where uh, in last five years, the intense heat, the death due to intense heat has been increased. And the NBS has been a focal point in uh, COP26, uh, which was in 2021. And we all know that uh, SDG 4, uh, like its uh, goal of SDG, along with that, education plays a very important role. Uh, you know, it's uh, like driving the other SDGs as well. So here also, uh, education helps to have a critical and the creative thinking among students, which can lead for sustainable communities. So the paper will uh, aim on to critically understand the concept, also its relevance in climate change education in urban schools to take actions. So uh, if we talk about nature-based solutions, nature-based solutions is a new jargon, which we uh, get to hear a lot in our day-to-day -day conversations. So first time it was discussed by World Bank in 2008. Along with that, in 2015, uh, NBS got a definition by European Commission, uh, which was widely accepted. Along with that, uh, in uh, like 2016, IUCN also got a um, uh, definition, which was widely accepted. 
So these are the uh, these are the definitions where I'll try to bring your focus that the NBS has to be something which are inspired from the nature and are, are also economically viable and which get mixed up with the uh, surroundings to get uh, to solve the societal issues by bringing gain to the biodiversity. So which actions to be called as NBS? Because there's a lot of confusion, something which comes up like new, uh, it's very broad and blurred. So which actions to be called as NBS? Like uh, there's a whole lot of uh, things, but uh, I'll try to focus only two important things where uh, whose we have taken the definition. So uh, according to IUCN, there are eight criteria. First, they should address the social issues. Second, uh, the scale of NBS actions and uh, third, biodiversity gains. So, uh, fourth, transparency in the governance. Fifth, economic viability. Sixth, balanced trade-offs. Seventh, evidence-based adaptive management. Eighth, mainstreaming. Along with this, there are five questions we need to ask from ourselves when we talk about NBS. So does NBS uh, use natural processes or are they giving any benefit to the society? And what are the economic benefits? And is there any gain in the biodiversity? And the fifth one, does it provide ecological environmental benefits? So the whole idea, the focus is on, uh, you know, the net, the net gain in biodiversity and increasing the ecological footprints. So the benefits and disadvantages of NBS. So the main advantage is that it, it is like a carbon sink. And along with that, if we talk about, uh, there's an example of this, that if we, uh, you know, uh, take uh, a land where we can increase the economic benefit also, by USD $170 billion each year. Uh, then second is uh, in Indian context, in case of Rajasthan, Tarun Bharat Singh has uh, you know, revived 11 rivers and 11,800 jhors in Rajasthan. Jhors is the area of water where like, which is used locally uh, for their users. So, but along with this, um, the NBS also has a relevance, uh, sorry. So uh, NBS also has a relevance uh, to SDG 13 climate action, where we can bring these things into mainstream of ecological integrity by addressing societal issues. Uh, so uh, drawbacks, if we talk about drawbacks, the definition is quite blurred and broad. So uh, it becomes a very uh, problematic thing. Second, uh, it acts like a counterbalance. First, we try to you know, uh, deplete the resources or reduce the things, and then we, at some other place, we just try to be uh, green we grow plants and all these things. So that may, uh, that may add uh, to some uh, balance the trade-offs, but also it's not necessary that the uh, gain of the bio biodiversity is very huge. That might be very low also. It's last minute for you. Yes, sorry. So the need of NBCs in the schools, if you talk about, approximately 70% students says, uh, the youth says they are not happy, they are not satisfied with the manner climate change uh, is being taught in the schools or in the colleges. So the NBS approach adds a value to if we integrate that with hands-on practices or outdoor education, that may help uh, to take actions for the climate education. So why schools as a critical site? Because uh, if we take a study by C, uh, C420 cool cities, the schools, if we use nature-based solutions, that may help to uh, the vulnerability of the students to uh, adapt with the climate change because they have shade areas, they can play for longer periods, and also they have a, a, like environment awareness to reach out their schools, and the remodel schools during their offs uh, or their, like uh, when they have holidays, that can be used as a shelter for the community members. So the influence of nature-based solutions in the, uh, in the learning. As we know, the nature also has a very positive impact along with this NBS also. So in nature, if we talk about, that helps to- uh, Hard stop. Uh, so uh, just one minute, last minute. So if we, if we take as NBS in the European schools, that is a case where the, uh, where the teachers has developed 15 learning scenarios and they were able to uh, find the positive impacts. So conclusion, yes, that is a very important step to strengthen the climate change education. Along with that, that helps to the schools for urban resilience to enhance the learning and development of students. So there is need for like much more discussions among the policy makers, the teachers, to introduce this approach to help uh, to solve the real-time issues. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
I'm sorry, like I was very hurt, like in hurry. It's very difficult to compile all these things within four to five minutes. Much appreciated. Thank, yeah, you, thank you so you. much. Can we have uh, Ms. Alka Bihari now? Good morning, everyone. I am Alka Bihari, and I am teaching at the Department of Education, University of Delhi. Now, the paper that I am presenting today is titled Re-Envisioning Teacher Preparation from the Perspective of Education for Climate Action and Sustainability. Uh, when we talk of teacher preparation, here I am referring to uh, preparing teachers for schools. Now, I want to give a little theoretical backdrop. Uh, so, so far, you know, sustainable development has emphasized on the preservation and conservation of the environment and nurturing the environment. Now we are talking more of environmental justice, and therefore, in this context, we can consider sustainability to be an intertwining of ecology, economy, and society. So therefore, you know, it becomes very essential for teachers that informs their teaching and pedagogy and the need of environmental education assumes even more significance. Now, the sustainable, the concept of education for sustainable development uh, has to be situated in a broader context of socio-cultural values and socio-political issues of equity, policy, and quality of life. So therefore, ESD has a multidisciplinary focus. Now, if we consider three targets of the sustainable development goals, particularly target 4.7, which says that by 2030, we have to equip learners with the knowledge and skills which are needed to promote sustainable development through education for sustainable development in various areas. And these include human rights, gender, equality, and uh, so many others. Similarly, the target 12.2 says that we must have in, uh, we must ensure that there is information and awareness for sustainable development which are in harmony with nature and target 13.3 also talks about improving education awareness raising and human and institutional capacity on climate change mitigation etc so therefore you know what comes out is that there is a more radical vision of uh, sustainability so what is important is not whether these concepts are present in the policy and the curriculum, but whether their presence is relevant for engaging in climate action and is inclusive. And when we say inclusive, it means that it has to be gender responsive, it has to be socially inclusive. Now, climate change, climate action, and education for climate action. We find that there is a link between climate action, SDGs, and education. Research shows that combating climate change can reinforce all the 17 SDGs, and education can act as a tool to advance action on climate change. So therefore, we need mutually reinforcing policies for education and climate change, and given the interdisciplinary nature of education for sustainable development that we just discussed earlier, how should learners be engaged in schools? That is the next question. And uh, we would have to enable students to be equipped with knowledge about climate change, gender, power, then developing skills, the green skills particularly, and developing attitudes which are pro-environmental, pro-equality, and pro-justice. So a more inclusive understanding of environment. Now, researchers at the moment are showing that climate component of climate change education is emphasized more and there is less talk on the consequences and therefore we need a more demanding more comprehensive com uh, education in that respect now the present study was undertaken in this context 
the objectives were two major objectives. The first one was to understand teachers' environment-related knowledge, skills, and attitudes, and to analyze their perceptions about the teacher education program that they had undergone with regard to preparing them for addressing environment-related issues in their teaching. Then the second objective was to study a teacher education institution as a case to understand its vision, the curricular and the pedagogic aspects, and the processes and practices which contribute towards preparing future teachers for climate change education. Now, uh, I'll just present the uh, findings and discussion in a brief. Uh, we found that many teachers have the cognitive knowledge about environment and related issues, but very few teachers have competencies or what one may call sustainable competencies, which include a combination of knowledge, skills, and attitudes, which are needed to act in more sustainable ways. And there is a need to make climate change education a part of mainstream, mainstream education within the formal school system. Now, we have... Uh, The second uh, uh, part of the study was the study of the teacher education institution as a case where we studied the vision, the curricular, and the pedagogic aspects, and the best practices. Now, the best practices demonstrated that there were efforts to integrate the principles and concepts of green campuses and sustainability. Uh, there, was also, there were also policies and approaches in place to promote gender equity and equal opportunities for everyone. There was a special focus on environment, building environment consciousness. So, you know, it, uh, what emerged was that CIE, the Central Institute of Education, is seen to be playing a significant role in preparing future teachers who have the potential to address various contemporary challenges in schools. So, and the best practices, these best practices, can serve as a model for other institutions to emulate. And therefore, it has tremendous implications for re-envisioning the preparation of teachers in all parts of the country. The summing up, I would like to say that you know the NEP, the national, the new education policy, resonates with the emphasis being given by contemporary researchers on the type of structure and processes which are required for educating for climate change and sustainability. And uh, they talk of a climate school, which is suggested by certain recent researchers, which is that idea is also akin to the multidisciplinary perspective and the establishment of multidisciplinary institutions in the country. Now, what the need at present is to get every school climate ready with a climate action-oriented education. And the task at hand is to prepare teachers who can take on this role. Thank you. May we have uh, Ms. Diksha Mohan as the next speaker? Is she around? No? So we'll give her a skip. Let's move on to Mr. Chandra Pratap Singh. Is he around? Please. This topic is uh, Revealing the Blue Terror of India, a systematic review on human Neil Guy conflict through print media reports. Over to you. Thank you, sir. Uh, hello, good morning, all. Myself, Chandra Pratap Singh Chandir, and with a relation from Wildlife School of India, I'm working on human wildlife conflict. So, I'm expecting the all people know about human wildlife conflict. So, let's move on. So, uh, due to the increasing level of unsustainable development, uh, industrialization and urbanization often lead to the degradation of forest and suitable habitat of wildlife. Uh, as forest habitat and suitable habitat degrades, wild animals come into direct contact with human, and as we can see depicted in these images, conflict takes place. Either wild animals harm human property or human uh, lives, and vice versa. In retaliation, in retaliation, human kill wild animals. So uh, studies have been shown that uh, there are a total of 88 wild animal species involved in conflict with human. But the problem is that only three species, namely elephant, tiger, and leopard, receive proper attention. However, we have no idea what's going on with other species. So considering this research gap, we thought to work on a species that is quite uh, conflict prone, that is quite common. And I believe most of the people know about Nilgai or Blue Bull. So this is the image of Nilgai. And actually, this is the print uh, cutout of a newspaper article. 
So Nilgai is a quite problematic species in northern India, and even we can see some Nilgai in uh, outdoors of uh, uh, Delhi. And in UP, it is quite common. So people from UP and Bihar is very much aware about Nilgai. So the, our current study has the following objective. First, to identify what are the areas in uh, entire India that is heavily affected by Nilgai. Second, we want to know what were the type and uh, frequencies of conflict with Nilgai. And third, to understand that vulnerability of different crop types, which are the proper crops that are mostly affected by Nilgai in India. So this is the flow chart. What we did, actually, we obtained secondary data from news articles. It was very interesting to see that there were very uh, less data printed on uh, research articles, so we opted for this uh, print media report. So we uh, uh, online searched in uh, uh, Google search engine, and uh, we used this uh, online edition of uh, different type of news articles. The data collection uh, time frame was uh, kept for 2018 to 22. And we collected and extracted two types of information from these news reports. First, type of conflict. Type of conflict, as we can see in the images, crop damage by Nilgai, attack by Nilgai, and road hit caused by Nilgai. And other uh, information that we extracted is the location of conflict from state, sub-district, and within sub-district, Tahsil, that is uh, also known as sub-district, Tahsil, or Taluka in India. So by using this data, we analyzed the frequency of conflict, this different type of conflict. And uh, also, we sum up the cases of conflict from each news reports. And then we use GIS database of Wildlife Institute of India. And we uh, created hotspot map based on the frequency of this conflict for different tassels and eventually for the state. So this is the result. Uh, the uh, graph uh, image here, uh, we can see, is actually a hotspot map for different state of India with incidences of conflict. So for uh, uh, blue uh, colored, you can see that uh, the cases will be one to five cases. That include attack on human, crop damage, and road hit. So uh, most of the information is uh, here in the table. It was found that Bihar ha state has the most problem of Nilgai. It has 78 tassels which are highly affected by Nilgai, with total of 313 cases, followed by Uttar Pradesh, which has 42 affected tassels with, with 134 cases, and followed by Madhya Pradesh state, which has 40 affected tassels and uh, 154 conflict cases. So here we can see. These three states, Bihar, Uttar Pradesh, and Madhya Pradesh, are in uh, hotspot of conflict of Nilgai. Uh, and here we can also see in the conflict category. So we, we broadly categorize the conflict incidences. And we found that crop trading, crop damage by Nilgai, is a major uh, concern, having a highest relative frequency of occurrence, followed by vehicle collision and other type of conflict, as well as attacks on human. So uh, if we look into different type of crop that damaged by Nilgai, it was found that Nilgai mainly damaged vegetable crop, cereal crop, and pulse crops. Among pulse crop, it was found that Nilgai mainly damaged pea, pigeon pea, and chickpea crop. In uh, cereal crop category, it was found that Nilgai damaged wheat, maize, and paddy crop in these affected tassels of different states. For vegetable crops, it was found that total of 18 type of vegetable crop was damaged by Nilgai, but in most of the cases, they did not specify the uh, name of that crop, but it was found that potato uh, garlic and coriander were mainly damaged by trampling and feeding by Nilgai. For uh, uh, cash crop category, it was found sugarcane and, and opium were more vulnerable to Nilgai damage. Similarly, for oil, link, oil yielding crop, it was mustard and linseed. So this was the first attempt uh, and the first of its kind of study for to assess the human Nilgai conflict and ad identify the hotspot at all India level. So our study have revealed that Bihar state is particularly facing a severe human Nilgai conflict with most of the states having uh, problem of Nilgai, followed by Uttar Pradesh and Madhya Pradesh. Across the species distribution range in India, it was found that crop damage is a major problem uh, uh, that is causing the conflict with Nilgai. Okay. So uh, it was also found that uh, vehicle collision uh, and a hit by a road hit uh, of uh, Nilgai vehicle collision was also a cause of conflict, followed by attacks on farmers by Nilgai. So mitigate to mitigate this conflict, there is need uh, there is a very strong need to conduct a study in these affected areas. And the, interestingly, we have already identified these uh, tassels, which respective authorities can consider and uh, start the initiatives. With this, I would like to acknowledge following people. And also, I would like to acknowledge University Grant Commission for providing me scholarship during this study. Thank you very much. for this. Can we have Mr. Rahul Chopra? This topic is democratizing climate knowledge, making climate change education accessible yes. to all.
So thank you very much. And uh, my name is Rahul Chopra. I'm a faculty member at Flame University in Pune. Additionally, I also direct a center there, which is the Center for Sustainability, Environment, and Climate Change. But today I'm wearing a different hat, and that is of a project director of a global climate change education project, which is called Tropic Zoo, which is what I'll be speaking about, which is attempted to sort of democratize climate change education. And fundamental questions which were raised in the conference last day, which is saying, how do you scale up quality climate change education. This is our small little attempt in attempting to do so. So I won't repeat too much because our organizers have generously given us four minutes. But just to summarize what has happened over the last day, and I think everyone here is aware of that, is that we know that this is the most critical issue of our time. We've also discussed that if we want to reach climate solutions, we need the general population to be aware of the issue. The general population who? The current and future generation of learners. How can we do this? We can do this through the education system, formal, informal. We think that the formal education system affords us an opportunity to basically uh, make people, current, future generations, aware of climate change. I'm not making them experts or so. But several problems exist, and those were discussed as well yesterday, which is essentially the syllabi of most countries does not include climate change in any meaningful way. We have talked about this, and you can all you have to do is look at UGC's model curriculum and see that even today it is fairly outdated and climate change doesn't really make its appearance in a meaningful way. The most critical sort of issue is that even if climate change does become part of the mainstream curriculum, the teachers currently are not equipped to teach it because they have not gone through that training. So how do we begin to sort of, you know, make some inroads into this? So our project, which is called TROPICSU, it stands for Transdisciplinary Research-Oriented Pedagogy for Improving Climate Studies and Understanding, basically has, has sort of tried to put together a suite of educational resources that teachers of all disciplines can use. That means if I'm a teacher in math, can I teach algebra using sea level rise? If I am a teacher in math, can I teach calculus using CO2 emissions data? If I am a teacher in English, can I teach grammar using a climate text? If I am a teacher in social sciences and I'm talking about gender, can I also stress upon the gender dimensions of climate change? So in this fashion, we have put together, collated, curated, and created about 800 teaching resources that teachers of all disciplines can use in their everyday teaching. The teacher doesn't have to be an expert in climate change. They need to be an expert in whatever they already teach, which they already are. Can they do an add-on? Think of this from the perspective of the student now, who in his or her classroom will now learn about climate change from the humanities perspective, social sciences perspective, chemistry, physics, math, every single discipline, and essentially would even be more of an expert than even us out here because they're learning it from this multidisciplinary lens or so. Uh, so essentially we've uh, gotten these in 10 different disciplines and these include teaching tools and lesson plans. And uh, interestingly, we've also had this system where we get our resources reviewed by climate experts for the science, as well as teaching experts to say, will it be used in their classroom? And if so, how much? Okay, so our 10 different disciplines here, of course it's easy enough and the main sciences are well represented, but what gave us a lot of joy was to start to put together topics in the humanities social sciences, economics, and math and statistics as well. So here's one example of what is available on our free to use website. Any teacher can go there and download. So topics in the humanities such as, instead of fiction, can you introduce climate fiction? Poetry, can you use climate poetry in your classroom to teach aspects of that? Gender, communication. If you are bold enough in your class, would you play a hip hop or rap album for your students to better engage with this material. 
So we have curated material, so these are digital pedagogical tools from experts around the world. I cannot be the expert in the humanities, science, social sciences, everything. All this material is available. We put it in the form of a lesson plan. Here's what a lesson plan looks like. It has all the different aspects that a teacher needs, including a step-by-step -step user guide for them to walk along, uh, along with that. Now, learning is best done in your location, in your context. The teacher is the change maker. He or she knows their students best. We have a lesson plan on climate impacts of every country in the world. We've introduced climate stories, which becomes a way for students to get engaged with from different aspects and different countries of the world. Of course, we directly align with SDG 4 and 13, but we've also, also mapped our tools to different SDGs. Yeah, now, yeah, just last slide. This is for the teachers. We hope for this to be by the teachers. We've conducted workshops in 11 countries and trained close to 1,000 teachers. Most importantly is the bottom one, where there are about 60 teacher-contributed lesson plans so that they become content creators. Uh, I'll stop here by saying this is you know, just our first attempt. We have about 800 resources. Partner with us. Help us create more resources. Help us do workshops in your part of the world. And let's basically take climate change education to every classroom in the world. So with that, I'll stop. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Our website is here, climated.org. Feel free to sure. browse through. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can we have Pooja Shri? Her topic is uh, educating for a sustainable future, empowering minds to combat climate change. Over to you, Pooja. Good afternoon to one and all. Myself, Pooja Shri Balamurgan. I'm a second year Bachelor of Social Work student from Salamaris College, Chennai. Here to present my research paper on educating for a sustainable future, empowering minds to combat climate change. I'm presenting this pa research paper to give you an overview of the current exploration in this area of research. The central idea of the research paper is to formulate a practical and mandatory climate education into the student's academic curriculum. The climate change poses one of the most pressing challenges of our time with far-reaching consequences for the environment, society, and economy. As the world grapples with the alarming impacts of anthropogenic activities on the planet, education emerges as a crucial tool to address the complex issues of climate change and sustainability. The objectives of this research paper include analyzing the role of education that would foster young minds towards sustainability, comprehending the impacts of climate change education, known as the Education for Sustainable Development, on students' attitude, behavior, and decision making, and finally, to present my project proposal as a solution for moving forward. Climate change and global warming are important topics in the science classroom because they are interesting natural phenomena that will likely have a significant effect on our lives and environment. At the same time, the literature on climate change focuses us to think about how we know what we know. School education at the elementary level is an essential part and can play a vital role in addressing society's current issues. The literature on climate change teaches us a lot about our home and also about our methods for understanding this home. The comprehensive theoretical framework offers a multi-faced approach to addressing climate change education within formal settings. The integration of climate change education and sustainable development into formal and informal education system represents a pivotal step towards nurturing environmentally conscious and empowered scholars. Embracing interdisciplinary approaches, leveraging media, community engagement, and online platforms can enhance awareness knowledge and pro-environmental behaviors among students. This holistic approach not only equips learners with vital skills, but also contributes to addressing complex global challenges while aligning with sustainable development goals. It underscores the transformative potential of education in shaping a more sustainable and equitable future for generations to come. 
Next, I would like to present a project proposal of mine. It is called Students' Responsibility for Environmental Care. So the project aim, involving students in climate change education, teaching them about sustainability, and enabling students to get a hands-on experience to address the complex environmental challenges and fostering a sense of responsibility toward the planet. My idea is to bring this project into students' curriculum. Every student from sixth grade has to start planting a tree sapling around their surroundings or anywhere viable and properly monitor and take care of the tree until they complete 12th grade. This has to be implemented as a mandatory practical assignment like any other conventional subjects in the curriculum. This project comes under the practical awareness subject as a part of social responsibility. Certain passing marks could be required for them to pass, and the procedure is to initiate a student sapling bond. The school ecosystem will be involved in assessing and monitoring all the individual pupil activities. Suitable modes of new digital and smart implementation is to be adopted, such as geotagging and e-updates for maintenance and improvisation. Suitable saplings can also be obtained from nonprofit organizations, other voluntary agencies, and the government. The web portal or the mobile app is to be designed to monitor and record the observations by students and teachers. With the growth of technology in today's world, this project can be updated from geotag to using sensor chips in the future. Students and parents will also gain a lot of knowledge about the increasing importance of controlling global warming, adverse climate changes, botany, and telecommunication system, which provides an opportunity to learn about medicinal plants, and this could lead a lot of scientists all over the world. So to conclude, every year, approximately in India, 50 lakh students write the 12th board exam, which means 50 lakh trees can be planted in our soil, which will lead to numerous benefits because trees act as a carbon sink and provide a means for pr food production in the market. By including this project as a mandatory subject in the academic curriculum, students will be inspired to plant trees and contribute their part in making this world a better place to live. Students are the leaders of today. Any change to be created is to be implemented through students via their curriculum to encourage them and their parents about our environment. I take this moment to thank ICSE for giving me this opportunity. And as I close my presentation, I shall be honored to discuss about my proposed project further and connect with everyone here to bring a change. Thank you. Our next presenter is Pooja. Topic is comparative evaluation of the florist, uh, floristic uh, diversity of Najafgarh Canal, Delhi, India. <coughs> Good afternoon, one and all. Myself, Pooja. I am research scholar from Guru Gobind Singh Indraprastha University. Today, I present on the topic of comparative evaluation of floristic diversity of Najafgarh Canal, Delhi. What are wetlands? Wetlands are transitional zone between aquatic and terrestrial terrestrial lands. It has many functions. It water storage, storm production, flood mitigation, uh, stabilization of local climate, particularly temperature and rainfall. Total wetlands in Delhi are 399 according to National Wetland Atlas. What are aquatic plants? Aquatic plants are those plants which are normally stands in water and must grow for at least a part of their life cycle in water, either completely submerged or immersed. Aquatic plants are classified in three different types. First is emergent plant, floating plants, and submerged plants. These plants formation can further classify into seven categories. Free floating hydrophytes, the species are in contact with water and air only. Floating leaved anchored hydrophytes, these species are in contact with soil and water as well as oil, say air. Floating shoot anchored hydrophytes, these plants are rooted in the muddy substratum with their shoot and leaf floating on the water surface are in contact with wat water, soil, and air. Suspended hydrophytes, these species are contact with water only. Submerged anchored hydrophytes, the entire plants or the most part of the are coming in contact with soil and water only. Sixth is the emergent anchored hydrophytes, 
एट द वाटर एज इज द जोन ऑफ इमरजेंट प्लांट्स द रूट द लोअर पार्ट ऑफ द स्टेम एंड समटाइम्स द लोअर लीव्स ऑफ दीज प्लांट्स आर यूजली समर्ज इन वाटर वेटलैंड हाइड्रोफाइट्स और एम्फीबियस हाइड्रोफाइट्स द कैटेगरी द सॉइल इज द यूजली सेचुरेटेड विद वाटर एट लीस्ट इन द अर्ली पार्ट ऑफ लाइफ मोस्ट ऑफ दैम हाउ एर कंटिन्यूस हो थ्राइव इवन आफ्टर द सबस्टेंटम हैज कंसिडरेबली ड्राइड अप The study area is Najabgarh Canal is the longest drain in Delhi. The Najabgarh Canal drain enters Delhi from Haryana from the southwest corner of Delhi. It transverses a length of 51 km Najabgarh Canal which enters into Delhi at Dhasa and joins the Yamuna River near the Wazirabad barrage in Delhi stretch. Out of 51 km stretch of canal nearly 31 km stretch of drain passes through the south west district of near dhasa to kakrola the point for sampling canal in the delhi stretch was selected based on the accessibility and availability of aquatic flora 10 sampling points from dhasa barrage to yamuna wazirabad barrage from a distance of approx 5 km along each canal was selected this study done during a period of 9 months from march to september sampling sites from dhasa barrage to yamuna wazirabad barrage were chosen from a distance of 5 km each on the richness of plant based on the richness of plant diversity during the field visit plant occurring in different water saturated area were collected photographed and identified the plant species were collected in their vegetative and reproductive stage field notes were also maintained in the time of collection collected plants were kept between the folds of newspaper avoiding any overlap until the plants were fully dried Pressed and dried specimen properly. Herbarium of each species are preserved according to the conventional herbarium technique. The identification was done with the help of relevant literatures and local inhabitants. Collected specimens are were dried and pressed. After drying, the plants were mounted on the herbarium sheet and uh, labeled properly for future purpose. After carefully screening of the life literature. Following aquatic plants were recognized. For each species, botanical name, family name, habitat, habit, GPS location, description were provided. Now, results and discussion. A total number of 34 species of aquatic macrophytic taxa belonging to 22 families were recorded. The most common families were Poaceae with seven species, followed by Asteraceae, three species, Fabaceae and Actinaceae, Euphorbiaceae, and two species with each one. There are 18 families, each present with one species. Out of 22 species recorded, 14 species of emergent agar hydrophytes, followed by nine species of massive plants. Massive plants are those plants which preferably moderate humidity and more frequently watering. Three species of amphibious, three species of floating shoot anchored, two species of fl free floating, one species of floating leaved anchored, one species of submerged anchored, one suspended or rootless submerged species. consider different life form we find 70 species of herbs seven species of grasses five species of tree three species of shrubs and two species of climbers comparison with previous data preliminary study conducted in 2021 on the floral diversity diversity of najabgarh drain in southwest delhi took 1.5 years to complete and total of 75 species were recorded which belongs to 72 genera and 32 families 39 species of aquatic plants were recorded by Maheshwari in 1963 the work was carried out for a duration of period of 10 years after making a comparison with previous work it was found that the number of aquatic plant species is recorded in 1963 were higher than the present year since the work had to be carried out in limited time period of 9 months only so no concrete conclusion could be drawn For but 34 species of aquatic plants were have been found to 79 species in 1963 by Maheshwari. <laughs> yes, sir. The study requires further survey and documentation for consecutive two three years to give a full description of plant species occur in this water body. These are the species. Thank you. Our next presenter is Tanushri. Is she around? Our topic is combating uh, climate change with sustainable measures. A case study of Mousuni Island. Mm -hmm. 
के लिए मिलके करें गुड आफ्टरनून एवरीवन माई सेल्फ तनुश्री बोस विथ माई को ऑथर मिस श्रिया दास वी आर स्टूडेंट्स फ्रॉम यूनिवर्सिटी ऑफ कैलकटा एंड एशुराइन एंड कोस्टल स्टडीज फाउंडेशन विल बी प्रेजेंटिंग ऑन दिस फॉलोइंग टॉपिक क्लाइमेट चेंज विद सस्टेनेबल डेवलपमेंट आर टू वे प्रोसेस बाई क्लाइमेट चेंज वी मीन इंटेंसिटी एंड फ्रीक्वेंसी ऑफ साइक्लेंस विद सी लेवल राइज क्रिएटिंग हैवॉक इन दिस आईलैंड The islands are vulnerable through embankment breaching and coastal erosions, and thus we need multi-level sustainable measures aimed to combat them. Our objective is to assess the suitability of this embankment to combat coastal inundation as a result of sea level rise and tropical cyclones, which are enhanced by ongoing climate change in the Mosni Islands. This is our study area. We have conducted our study in this Moshuni Island, which is a part of Indian Sundarban, and it is exposed to continuous wave dashing. We have deployed surveying techniques, and erosion accretion analysis uh, is drawn to ob uh, address the objective. In this map, we have shown changes from 1985 to 2022. and the red portion of this map shows the erosion and the yellow portion represents the accretion scenario it is due to the following reasons mentioned in the presentation and also the relative sea level rise around the moshuni island is about 12 to uh, 8 to 12 mm per year aggravating coastal erosions the further slides will be carried on my quarter the region has faced recent cyclonic impacts of bulbul amphan yas over the following years respectively the tracks of the cyclones are shown here creating havoc on the moshuni island i would like you to draw your attention towards the highlighted portions of the table so there are three mainly types of embankments in moshuni island namely concrete island embankment with groins earthen embankment covered with geojute and wooden log embankments temporal changes mainly of geojute embankment during monsoon and pre monsoon season within 2 to 3 months are shown depicting the rate of increasing vulnerability so i hope that we can understand the risk posed during the cyclonic period based on our primary survey cyclone and flood shelters are not uniformly distributed as observed in the island formation of salt pan due to the groundwater contamination by saline water is also observed in the island as a part of sustainability the following measures can be considered likely retreat of settlements away from the coast coastal regulation zone 1 norms should strictly be followed mangrove and other plantations should be planted acting as a natural buffer on the vulnerable areas and lastly capacity building as well as regular monitoring of the measures should be maintained further so as we have come to the end of our presentation we would like to thank the fifth international conference on sustainability education for providing us the opportunity and also our foundation thank you thank you can i now invite uh, smitha varnikar the next speaker the five s's of sustainability application of old school ha huh? the time is 5 minutes Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of Global Schools Foundation Singapore, me and Vikram would be presenting our topic, the five S of sustainability, application of whole school approach for sustainability in our Global Schools Foundation. How do you? Okay. Uh, we are a growing organization. We now have over 64 campuses spanning across 11 countries and 10 brands. Uh, our goals in integrating sustainability into our school framework encompass several key facets, which are creating a culture of sustainability, nurturing future generation of sustainability advocates and leaders, 
reduce our environmental impact of our school and also forging strong partnerships within the local community. With these goals in mind, we initiated to create an all-encompassing environment and sustainability management system for our group of schools. The UN SDGs resonated deeply uh, with our values and served as a natural uh, extension of our foundation school values. Hence, we partnered with global schools program to apply the principles of UN SDGs in all our schools. So uh, the GSS framework stemmed from the whole school approach. This approach recognizes that sustainability is not a standalone concept, but a mindset that needs to be woven into the fabric of education. Our five pillars are the structure and governance pillar ensures that the school has robust structures in place to address sustainability related matters. We have a sustainability committee at GSF level and then team in our school level. Heart of any educational institution lies in its students and their learning experiences. In students and learning pillar, we have incorporated, we have tried to incorporate sustainability concepts into our curriculum and beyond classroom, we have experienced experiential learning opportunities and student-led initiatives uh, aligned with the UN SDGs. In school management and operations, we try to implement school-wide strategies to reduce our energy and water consumption, reduce our waste generation, and reduce our carbon footprint. And of course, uh, emphasizing construction of uh, green and sustainable buildings and generally uh, greening the landscape as well. In Stakeholder Connect, uh, our framework emphasizes the importance of involving all stakeholders of the community, uh, whether it's parents, school students, staff, and uh, the local community as well. In recognition <coughs> of importance of equipping both students and staff with vital skills, skill development comes into play. And we facilitate regular training sessions for schools, uh, teachers, as well as uh, students. To implement our framework, our structure approach has been devised, where we have first we communicate our policies, then uh, we set the measurable and achievable targets, and then we implement the plans and we monitor the progress. Thanks, Nita. Um, well, we know that establishing a framework alone is not enough. We want to make sure that there's a system in place to ensure there's a robustness as well. So over here in GSF, we actually established a few KPIs, indicators that you see on the screen over here. Just uh, very quickly running through some of it, we actually track the number of activities, uh, UN SDG activities that students are doing in per campus as well. Uh, also, like what she mentioned, in terms of green building features, we are also monitoring that our schools are more green. Um, so these are some of the KPI trackers that we have. What you see on the left is sustainability awareness survey is what we do for all our 64 campuses globally. Uh, this is to make sure that we actually gauge the sustainability awareness in those schools as well. We also track uh, each of the campuses, electricity bills, water bills, and waste management, and make sure there's a reduction every month as well. So I think day one of ICSC conference, we talked about you know, how we need, uh, there's a lot of challenges and how we have to cope with the challenges. Uh, some of these things that we're also facing in GSF, you know, some of the teachers have given us some feedback. Uh, what we're doing is we're now leveraging on technology. All right? We actually have a learning management system in place. Uh, we upload a lot of sustainability-related uh, documents as well as uh, projects of what the students have done so that students can also take a look at some of these initiatives that, uh, that has been going on in the campuses. So our journey does not just stop here. I'm quite uh, pleased to announce to you all that the Global Schools Foundation has just published its inaugural sustainability report 2022-2023 as well. Uh, this report can be found uh, in our website. Uh, please go and take a look at it. Uh, sustainability for us is just about, it's not just about doing an activity, but also creating awareness, not just for students, but also for teachers, parents, and our investors. We have done that by uh, launching our newsletters that encompasses all the 64 campuses. Uh, just to wrap up my presentation very quickly, uh, this is a few initiatives in our horizon for GSF. Our first thing is we want to introduce a sustainability curriculum within all our campuses. So this is not something that's educational, but it's something that's transformational. And we aim to achieve it by early next year through this curriculum. And second step is to also align on the national level sustainability plans that we have, because we have around uh, 64 campuses across 11 countries. So we also want to make sure that students are also aware of what the countries are doing in terms of sustainability. Last but not least, this is the most ambitious of us all, is uh, we want to achieve carbon neutrality for all our campuses by 2030 as well. Uh, with that, I just want to wrap up my presentation. Thank you so much to ICSC for giving us this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Next, the 
and the topic is comparative analysis of forest fire frequencies in different forest divisions of Madhya Pradesh using remote sensing data. Over to you. A warm greeting to all the delegates. I am honored to be here to present and discuss a pressing issue of environment and climate change that demands our immediate attention, that is forest fire. I am Vibha Sahu, a PhD scholar at Indian Institute of Forest Management, Bhopal. So, when we look into the literature, globally forests occupy about 31% of total forest area, that is about 4.60 billion hectare, and India alone is a, a significant player in the world ecological landscape, contribute about 2% to the global forest cover. The nation is lo losing 1.6 million hectare of forest each year. To put this into perspective, it's, it's nearly twice the size of Andaman and Nicobar Ireland. We all know that India made a crucial commitment at the COP in 2015 as a part of Bone Challenge. The uh, commitment entails 26 million hectare of its degraded forest by 2030. This move expands India's forest by approximately 36%. As per the report of CEW, more than 62% of Indian state are prone to forest fire. There has been a tenfold increase in forest fire incidences in last two decades. The more, and the more vulnerable regions are uh, presented here, that is Himachal Pradesh, Uttarakhand, uh, Northeast, uh, Northeastern uh, states, Mizoram, Odisha, and Madhya Pradesh. And among these, three are uh, most uh, frequent fire happening in central India and uh, in the Deccan Plateau, and also in the Uttarakhand part. So what is fire? Fire uh, evolved from the Greek word pyra, meaning growing embers. The fire ignite when three components available, that is oxygen, heat, and fuel. Uh, forest fire are widespread yet concentrated, which vary according to the reasons to region. Fire are seasonal phenomena, generally occur in the month of mid-February to June every year. This is caused by various natural and social factors, also uh, expected by climate change. Literature shows that 95% of uh, forest fire happening because of the uh, anthropologic reasons, uh, which result in forest degradation and their resources. Uh, this is the statistics about forest fire in our country. Uh, uh, you can see in the graph, uh, estimated burn area is um, uh, highest in Deccan, uh, Deccan region, and after that, the Central Highland. Uh, it comes under the uh, Madhya Pradesh region. These are the biggest challenges for fire, fire prevention, that is lack of awareness and education, inaccessibility of talent affected by fire, lack of equipment, technology, and infrastructure, labor shortage, and insufficient financial resources, poor agency coordination with different departments. The objective of my study is to assess and compare forest fire frequencies across three districts for, uh, of forest divisions, that is Khandwa, North Battle, East Mandla, uh, with respect to forest type rainfall pattern in Madhya Pradesh, India. These are the study area and the forest type in different area in Khandwa region, mainly the forest type is tropical dry deciduous forest, which dominated with teak species. North Patul region, uh, tropical dry and tropical moist deciduous forest. And in East Mandla region, south tropical dry deciduous forest and moist peninsular high level salt forest. These classification are, uh, are, um, are done by the champion and seed. The method methodology I have used for uh, Study is uh, remote sensing. Uh, I have collected modest fire data from NASA firms and also validated from Forest Survey of India from 2010 to 2021. And uh, for spatial analysis, I have used uh, Landsat images, that is seven and eight, uh, from USGS Earth Explorer from 2010 to 2021 uh, for fire uh, months. Uh, these are the methodology for my study, uh, downloading Landsat uh, satellite images from open source map were uh, generated using supervised classification technique employing maximum likelihood algorithm. This involved utilizing the infrared composite images with band combination of 543 in RGB. For each month from January to May, a district fire map was constructed providing a detailed overview of fire occurrence. The raster map were calculated into vector format where distinct value were assigned to burnt and unburnt area. The vector again converted in raster and calculated the uh, area in hectares. These are the result and maps the uh, red color showing the highest uh, frequency of forest fire in each divisions. 
And these are the forest points uh, uh, collected from modis firms. These are the area in different, uh, uh, in different category. Low fire contains zero to three times fire in 10 years. Medium fire contains uh, three to five, uh, five year fire. High fire contains more than six time fire in 10 years. These are the trend of, trend of forest, uh, for forest fire in study area. The highest fire trend showing in 2021. And this is the rainfall, uh, rainfall of the study division. There is no any pattern of rainfall. So I tried to correlate rainfall and annual forest fire incidences. So I uh, found that there is a not much correlation between the rainfall and uh, fire incidences. So I correlated with forest uh, types. And then I found that uh, a forest type and the presence of moist deciduous species directly influence the frequency of forest fire. Khandwa Forest Division reports higher frequency of fire despite good rainfall. The number of fire in incidences has been increasing in recent year. The study identified frequently burnt area for better management purposes. And uh, uh, for uh, further study, we have to uh, try to multidimensional approach to, uh, to try to explore the various in, uh, influencing factor and uh, uh, study about the forest fire and their management. These are the differences of my study. Next uh, speaker is Manjuri Upreti, and she'll be talking on enhancing climate resilience through urban green space restoration. Insights from Delhi Urban Agglomeration. <coughs> Good afternoon, uh, one and all. Uh, I'm Manjuri Upreti from the Central University of Jharkhand, Department of Geoinformatics, a research scholar. Today I'll be discussing about a case study uh, and, uh, entitled Enhancing Climate Resilience Through Urban Green Space Restoration, Insights from Delhi Urban Agglomeration. Uh, as we all are aware that urban areas are experiencing severe implications of climate change uh, due to the unsustainable anthropogenic activities leading to a complex urban, eco, uh, uh, urban ecological infrastructure and hampering the livability of uh, the residents. Here I have used, uh, I have sh uh, shown, uh, the study con conceptualized the idea of uh, how long-term investigations of rising influence of urban species predominant on the green infrastructure in the metropolitan cities and their hinterland can uh, support in preparation of long-term or short-term uh, plans for conservation and restoration. So the uh, earth observation data sets, uh, satellite-based earth observation data sets are very much useful for measuring the spatiotemporal patterns of the land, uh, land use alterations and their interrelationships. And understanding these uh, uh, alterations and tra the shrinking of green spaces addresses the spatial relationship between different ecological infrastructure and helps to delineate nature-based solutions in urban planning. This is the study area. Uh, the National Capital Territory, uh, which is located in the given latitudes, and it is known uh, it is known as the second most populous city in the world, covering the area of uh, 1,483 square kilometers. Uh, that uh, okay, I'll move on. Uh, this is the these are data sets and the methodology that has been used. I have used Landsat data sets, TM and OLI TIRS, uh, and it has been processed using the Google Earth Engine platform. It is a cloud-based pl platform. Uh, from which we have uh, uh, done a uh, LULC classification using support vector machine classifier for around five decades from 1973 to 2020. And we have reclassified those data sets into impervious surfaces and green cover areas. And later on the population data set from uh, global human settlement layer were used uh, to estimate the per person green space, how much area is there to quantify the spatial pattern analysis. Later on, uh, the modest data sets are used in order to estimate the long-term diurnal uh, land surface temperature anomalies for both nighttime and daytime, where we have used a pixel-based analysis for the month summer, uh, where we have considered April, May, and June. The overall, uh, the overall analysis gave us the role of urban landscape pattern on land surface temperature. And these are the uh, classified images, which uh, are clearly depicting that how the impervious area uh, the impervious surfaces are increasing over the years with a decline. The green line you can see uh, in the graph is declining from 1973 to 1994, uh, uh, and after 2014, an increase in green spaces can be seen. A zonal-based analysis has been done in order to see that uh, how 
the changes in uh, the green space and the impervious surface are taking place in different quadrants and different proximity zone. For every 20 kilometer, we have uh, uh, delineated a proximity zone to see how the changes are being there. So you can see from 1973 to 80, uh, to, from 19, uh, to 1994, a moderate to high growth can be seen in the core zones. And after that, the sprawling pattern has increased. And over the years, it has been increasing with a decrease of green cover till 1994. And later on, a, a boost up in green spaces has been seen. So for the per capita urban green space and daily ar uh, urban agglomeration uh, based on the zonal level analysis shows the hotspot zones of UGS loss that is in the southwest, northwest, west, northeast, and north, uh, northwest parts during 1973 to 2014. According to WHO, each city must provide a minimum nine meter square of urban green space per individual. And based on that, the analysis shows that after uh, uh, 2014 to 2020, a UGS recovery, a very significant increase in, U in per capita UG UGS is observed. So due to uh, the listed actions plan, like green action plan taken by the government of NCT, smart city mission, afforestation in the ridge, provision of 30 meter belt along the major roads in Sonepat and Haryana by the development plan. So these alterations in the land, uh, landscape in the urban region and their neighborhoods are linked with the alterations with the land surface temperature. Here I have used uh, the modest data sets. For daytime LST and nighttime LST, you can see uh, the anomaly. It is the deviation from the mean, how much temperature is increasing or decreasing, which is ranging from minus four to plus four. So uh, a better representation can be seen using a Hofmuller plot, which shows the average of all the values in a row or a column uh, with reference to the latitude or longitude. Here I've shown uh, with reference to the longitude how temperature has been changing. So you can see that an uh, increase of 2.5 to uh, 3 degree during 2013 and an episodic rise and fall of maximum temperature has been seen. Uh, similarly for the nighttime, it, it, the interesting fact is that the daytime temperature has been decreasing after a certain period, but the nighttime temperature is still increasing in the recent decades, which is, a problem, which is problematic and uh, which shows uh, uh, an accelerating impact of heat stress. So uh, to combat all these, uh, we have to uh, look for some nature-based solutions uh, like multidisciplinary approach, uh, the development of green infrastructure plan, and green roofing, green waste, sustainable mobility. So one of the example is sustainable mobility is here, the super block model, which mainly works from vehicle or uh, transition from vehicle oriented to a people oriented. So we can, uh, we can have uh, roads and highways and uh, along with green waste so that it can uh, give us a healthy environment. Similarly, a ground-based study I have conducted from which I have taken around uh, more than 200 data points, single three data points, in different green spaces like avenue plantation, reserve and uh, reserve forest, parks, uh, parks and gardens, from which we have seen that these are the dominant species which are better, uh, with, which have high uh, heat resistivity and pollution resistivity. So based on that, we can see that the temperature is averaging from 28 to 36 degrees in all these green spaces. So it gives us an idea that how plantation of trees is more important and uh, also what type of plants we are uh, planting. A heterogeneity uh, should be there, a diversity should be there. Yeah, it's concluding. So in conclusion, the study provides an insight to analyze the concurrent issues in the metropolitan cities and necessitate urgent adoption of nature-based solutions and how earth observation-based uh, data sets can be used uh, for regular monitoring of the uh, green spaces. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next uh, presenter is Shalini. Exploring the interplay between climate change, risk appraisal, psychosocial adaptive capacity, pro-climate action, and mindfulness, a study in the mountain regions of Himachal Pradesh. A uh, uh, very warm, warm good morning, everyone. I'm Shalini Dagar, a research scholar at Indian Institute of Forest Management, Bhopal. Uh, under the uh, guidance of Dr. Parul Rishi, my research work revolves around the behavioral dimension of climate change. And uh, I'm here to present on the topic of exploring the interplay between climate change risk appraisal, social behavioral adaptive capacity, pro-climate action, and mindfulness, a study in the mountain regions of Himachal Pradesh, India. The, these are the table of uh, contents of my presentations. Uh, 
So the base of my study lies on the urgent need of behavioral transformation for climate action as we are in the era of climate emergency. And the biophysical mitigation alone don't look enough for achieving net zero emission by 2050. For these transformation to happen, youth are the best suited for the role as they serve as both the contributor and potent agents for the change. Being ecologically sensitive, mountain regions are more prone towards climate change and pertinent to be considered for the study. Here the climate uh, risk appraisal comes in the picture as it plays decisive roles in adaptation and coping. Therefore, climate change risk appraisal of youth from a, uh, from a social behavioral perspective have been emphasized in the study. Further, the socio-cultural aspect of mountain region hold many spiritual beliefs and values towards environment and many follow certain contemplative practice for their culture. Moreover, from the perspective of social representation theory, it is important to look at common knowledge of people about climate risk, which would further help in defining the adaptive capacity of these individuals on basic level of mindfulness. So uh, 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 this part shows climate change in mountain regions, and uh, uh, this shows both the problem and the certain major measures uh, which to be followed in the mountain region of area. Uh, for the problem, I could say uh, mountain regions have elevation dependent warming or uh, short for in re reliable climate change records, remoteness, low mobility and marginalization. For that, we could, uh, we need uh, a mountain specific adaptive mechanism and need for social psychological models are felt. Objective of my study is to explore the climate change risk appraisal of youth residing in mountain regions of Himachal Pradesh to study the level of, of adaptive capacity of youth from social behavioral perspective, to study the relationship between climate change risk appraisal and adaptive capacity and pro-climate action, to study the mediating role of mindfulness in climate change risk appraisal and adaptive capacity and pro-climate action. This is the conceptual model of my study. Inde independent variables are risk appraisal. In that, we have covered perceived probability, perceived severity, and risk perceptions, and mindfulness being the mediator, and the dependent variables are adaptive capacity and pro-climate action. For the method methodology, we have used judgment and sampling, and eight districts have been covered for, the, for, uh, for the, this study. And uh, uh, youth respondent of 1070 uh, samples have been collected. And for the data analysis, we have used SPSN and JAS software till now. And uh, uh, for the methodology part, uh, my tool uh, comprises of three scale, climate change risk appraisal inventory, adaptive capacity climate action scale, mindfulness scale. And uh, for the reliability, we, uh, we uh, actually uh, check the Cronbach Alpha, and all the scores uh, was zero, uh, above 0 0.7. After that, uh, we conducted common method bias for, uh, for all the scales. And uh, after that, uh, we performed co uh, common factor analysis of the same. These were uh, the agenda of my climate action workshop, which I've conducted in different various uh, districts, which com uh, comprises talks on climate action, climate change perceptions, concept of climate change adaptation, and role of behavioral science. These are the stats or shots of data collection in different districts of Himachal Pradesh. So uh, my first objective uh, uh, was to explore the climate change risk appraisal of youth residing in mountain region of Himachal Pradesh. Uh, of that, uh, a box plot uh, I have uh, given here, and uh, we found that surveyed college going, going in Himachal Pradesh on average tend to have a moderate level of risk appraisal with some variability in responses. Male students' appraisals are slightly skew skewed to the left, suggesting more positive scores. Female students' appraisals are slightly skewed to the right, indicating a great concentration of positive scores. Uh, my second objective uh, on uh, uh, results were, on average, college going youth in Himachal Pradesh have a moderately positive social behavioral adaptive capacity with females slightly higher on average. And the distributions are fairly symmetrical with slight leftward skewness indicating a concentration more positive ones. Uh, next, uh, relationship, uh, all the variables were uh, positively correlated. And last uh, result was that mindfulness was found to be partially, uh, partially mediated relationship between climate change risk appraisal and social behavioral adaptive capacity. Other observation was adaptive behavioral 
capacity was found to fully mediate the relationship between climate change receptors and pro climate action and these are the uh, implication future uh, intervention of my study integrating mindfulness in youth skill building programs empowering you to co create uh, adaptation agenda and further research on mindfulness thank you thank you now it's time for mr arun kumar evolutions of air pollution laws in india after 1947 Uh, very good afternoon everyone i am arun kumar yadav and uh, the objective of my study is to understand how the air pollution law are evolve after independence of india especially and uh, we all know that air pollution is one of the burning issues these days and uh, uh, out of 50 uh, third, uh, out of 39 out of 50 cities most polluted cities are in india and uh, we all know that air pollution causing the different par um, uh, affected our all part to lungs and all vital part or vital organ of the our body and also uh, impact almost the 3% 3.3% of global economy as well and uh, to tackle these uh, challenges and uh, so air pollution uh, the indian government also brings some uh, air pollution law from the so from the startings and uh, these are all are impacted from the different factor like the global and local event international conventions and the ngos and uh, the judicial interpretation uh, intervention time to time and uh, and first of all the you know, starting come from the 1940s uh, in the after independence the you know, the constituent constitution are formed the fir, uh, indian constitution are first time actually they including the uh, article uh, article like right to uh, article 21 right to life and which is interpreted by the supreme court time uh, as a um, right to clean air and at the same time article 48a dpsp um, under directive principle state policy that is state duty to provide a clean environment and same uh, uh, article 51 ag uh, 42nd amendment they actually uh, most important as well the fundamental duty not only state even the citizens duties to conserve or protect our environment and uh, article in uh, next article 253 is the uh, giving the international whatever indian government are signed in international level we have to follow and emulate these law in our uh, constitution and in our laws like international convention line, line, uh, like the stockholm conference in 1972 which is most important and actually these conference actually uh, increase the environmental awareness among the actually first time uh, international level and uh, there are different convention happening and uh, indian government inspire to changes such laws in our uh, to bring some changes law in our uh, constitutions and laws uh, throughout uh, duration and same time the global uh, event also happening uh, like the silent spring which uh, increase the environmentalism movement throughout global level and bhopal gas tragedy um, Uh, actually that uh, after that we uh, government bring epa environment Prote protection act 1986 then um, after uh, ministry of department earlier their department of environment 90 set up in 1980s which are form ministry of uh, in 1985 which uh, uh, form into the ministry of environment and forest and same uh, great delhi smoke 2016 uh, we all are witness uh, definitely and uh, Uh, that time actually after 2016 government bring grab G, uh, which we all uh, read newspaper and daily newspaper and um, ncap national clean air programs actually uh, these events influence the uh, government to bring some changes like judicial interpretation by the supreme court or judicial uh, mc mehta case like taj trapezium case and uh, introduction of cng in delhi and um, they same set up some industrial zone in delhi to uh, ban the Com uh, commercial activity or industrial activity in within the resident residential area to shift them to outside delhi uh, delhi ncr and same uh, time to time actually they uh, bring like a P, uh, pli pil uh, uh, pollution pay principle in uh, bichri case and uh, uh, to uh, to clear up two cases like uh, they set up set different tribunal ngt in 2010 uh, as well and uh, role of ngos and civil societies like the csc and um, mobius uh, or apna um, these uh, 
toxic link and uh, meta foundation actually they actually enforce the government to bring some soft manner to uh, change the policy so these actually uh, convention uh, after these uh, uh, so much enforcement government so bring the first law time uh, first uh, air fall law related to directly on clean air act 1981 which is uh, define air pollution and uh, set up some uh, cpcb and fpcb at state level in, and uh, better, uh, pollution emitter industries they have uh, taken some permission before set up they have to take permit from the government and uh, penalize uh, to enforce the punishment and uh, and uh, and after that 1986 before uh, because 1984 already happened um, uh, bhopal gas tragedy we bring the umbrella act we include the uh, water act 1974 air act 1981 they include uh, set 1986 epa and more uh, give more power to the central government and uh, we, uh, we have to uh, Uh, appoints of environment officer strange in penalty and punishment are also included and same time uh, in during the period of time they also include the uh, nacwem uh, set up some air quality monitoring stations in the time to time motor vehicle act like the aqi to increase the mass level awareness among uh, uh, common people about the air quality some grab 2017 and uh, ncap 2019 ncap is the first law actually they cover uh, earlier law actually they are only for, uh, they are focused to the delhi uh, delhi ncr but ncap including the throughout pan india and uh, in last uh, the major challenge is still we have to the uh, laws are formed but they are not considering the local level uh, local ground level situations the guidelines uh, need we actually we need composite law include water air uh, comp uh, all aspect of the environment then then form a law and uh, we need air shed approach as well to tackle air pollution because air pollution doesn't follow any political boundary so we need air shed approach and uh, same time we have to em uh, more em Our, our CPCB State Pollution Control Board. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, this is actually a picture I have taken, and uh, some few words related to. Uh, thank you. Our next presenter is Palash Naya. Is he around? No. Can we move on to uh, Vani Bharadwaj? Is she around? <coughs> The spectrum of gender justice and sustainability education yeah. for climate justice. Good afternoon, everybody. I am Vani Bhartwaj, a research scholar at IIT Guwahati, and you can see the title of my presentation today. So, the significance and scope. So, basically, I'm trying to create the interlinkages between gender and climate change, as has been recently declared at the G20 Delhi Declaration, that nearly 38 million children undergo disrupted education due to climate change-related disasters annually. Now, Dalit girls particularly have to bear the burden of climate change because of disruption of education, because there are school dropouts and discontinued education, because they have to cater to uh, the agricultural slavery that they are in. in and the human trafficking and informal sector employment now women and adolescent girls are essentially um, the solution and the problem solvers for climate justice related issues because climate uh, change has aggravated impacts not only on young girls and women but also lgbtq population regarding the aggravated homelessness issues that arise because of climate change So the research questions that I'm looking at are how climate change will affect girls and women distinctively, and how girls' education and health are correlated to consolidate sustainability education, and then can girl climate leadership and sustainability education result in long-lasting effects? So the research methodology and method would be about a secondary literature review about, uh, and I have created a cycle of continuum, which is uh, an approach from preteens, teenage to womanhood, and it is a cyclical approach because uh, you may see that from elderly we have again gone to pre-adolescence, but that's actually intergenerational justice. So the next generation will get the legacy of the kind of uh, comprehensive sexuality education. So this is something that can be passed on intergenerationally, and therefore we can say that comprehensive sustainability education is synchronous to uh, comprehensive sexuality. quality education now what is the context as i have earlier mentioned the gender and climate justice has an axis and therefore interlinkages uh, are spread across climate change health and gender so uh, there have been studies regarding how air pollution and water pollution have direct impacts on the reproductive health of women uh, particularly pregnant women and how it impacts young uh, girls and adolescents regarding their reproductive system so uh, uh, there are diseases such as pcos that are quite prevalent now which are called lifestyle diseases but are interrelated with uh, microplastic pollutions and also air pollution 
and then the cosmetics industry, which largely caters to young women and, um, and children, uh, adolescent women as well now, has to be careful how uh, it can have these disastrous impacts related to climate change. And therefore, there needs to be uh, there needs to be a space where we have this awareness about sustainability education that are creating these interlinkages for young minds. Now, interlinkages between climate change, education, and gender. Uh, so, when there are disasters and flood and cyclones that are uh, that hit schools, right? So there is uh, this discontinued education that happens. And there are studies um, that are hardly there, in fact, regarding um, mental and psychosocial health care, regarding girls who uh, undergo trauma because, you know, if you have discontinued education, your entire school flooded. And so there are these peer-to-peer -peer support networks that need to be created because there's this continued education and women have to drop out and there are forced marriages that continue to occur in different uh, parts of not only India but across different continents. So where do the queer folks figure in this? So we hardly talk about critical menstruation studies and how there is the right to privacy but that is taken away for queer folks and also the homeless people because uh, homeless people have to uh, you know really talk about their sexual rights and uh, reproductive health rights and that is something that is completely marginalized in our discourse for sustainability education so how we need to look at the intersectionalities of say the homeless uh, people and also the queer population and also the Dalit women young girls so there are gender-based violence interlinkages with climate change so we see that as climate change is occurring there are exacerbated impacts on women and particularly gender-based violence cases are increasing across uh, Africa, Asia, and Latin America, so particularly the global south and global majority, majority world countries. So building the case for gender just sustainability education, so United Nations Girls Education Initiative in fact talks about how a sustainability curriculum is in fact required uh, and we need to have gender disaggregated data uh, regarding risks and vulnerabilities. And I would also like to point out that SRHR, which are the sexual uh, rights and the health, uh, se sexuality and reproductive health rights, they also involve young boys and men and they also need to talk about uh, these issues and so that uh, understanding of harmful touch and advances within family and at school can be uh, talked about openly so that in other kinds of social relation it facilitates prevention of rape and unwanted pregnancies and unsafe abortions. So we see how climate change related impacts um, have gender injustice um, repercussions and we can prevent that by uh, enhancing uh, comprehensive sexuality education. So uh, CSC however faces confrontation from culturally ethnocentric and anti-gender groups across different countries and so there is lack of privacy and greater risk for gender-based violence in disaster relief shelters. So you have flood and cyclone and in the post uh, in the aftermath of the disasters the relief shelters uh, have lack of privacy. Uh, so climate sensitive and green embedded pedagogies within classroom are of course required, but we also need to go beyond uh, advocating for lowest carbon footprint, but also enhancing circular economy, particularly in say menstrual products, so that would be gender sensitive. So teaching emergency life skills, so in Bangladesh there have been case studies where you know young girls and older women have been left behind, mainly because they were trying to rescue all the other members and putting themselves at the back front. So, uh, and they did not know us uh, swimming, uh, and other related life skills. So uh, the delivery in emergencies with minimum resources for pregnant members of the communities are required during disaster management. Uh, uh, climate adaptation strategies at national level and national adaptation plans include SRHR, but the intersection of gender, health, and adaptation to climate change still remains understudied. Girl-led climate leadership that informs discourse on sustainability in schools and colleges is actually taking place across all continents, so at a transnational level. Gender transformative education, therefore, is important to address climate injustice, inequity, and climate change-induced violence. So in conclusion, I would say that we can learn from communities of practice approach, which is basically trying to bridge theory and practice. And in that regards, personally, I have, uh, I have founded a gender and climate justice circle at Society of Gender Professionals, which connects more than 600 uh, academia, civil society organization, and young activists. So CSC is an awareness for prevention of gender-based violence, which uh, is exacerbated by climate change related injustices. So GBV is related to climate change and that is why CSC is actually a solution and also a solution would be transnationalist feminist networks that uh, are catering not only to, to the majority world but connecting the global north and the global south and in that regards I would like to say that come and join my gender and society professionals <laughs> circle as well. So sustainability education therefore encompasses gender sensitive curriculum and upholds gender justice as climate justice. Thank you everybody. Thank you. Thank our last uh, presenter is uh, Ms. Seema Purohit Ishiram, Learning Garden Living Museum, a case study of sustainability education. 
Uh, together? Yeah. Okay. Five so, minutes. Yeah. Five minutes, yeah. uh, okay. so I am uh, Dr. Seema Purohit. So maybe I was wondering that uh, being a mathematician, uh, why I am uh, over here. So this itself actually it uh, demonstrates that how uh, the climate related uh, sensitivity can bring a mathematician to this platform. Uh, we and my co-author uh, Vijaya, uh, we are working for Indian Women Scientist Association as well as Cam Climate Reality uh, Foundation. Uh, so, our concept, the learning the garden itself, uh, it demonstrate the case study or the presentation that uh, how the open learning system can be adopted even because we are from Mumbai and Mumbai getting a small land or piece of land is more than enough and even that can be turned into the learning garden. Uh, so, this is uh, what our learning garden living museum, a case study of sustainability education and uh, we are the presenters. Uh, so, this is the flow uh, that is the background and introduction then uh, what this LGLM that is learning garden and learning museum concept uh, which is devised by friends Vijaya, Rita and uh, Paramjit. Uh, unfortunately they could not be here but then they would have uh, uh, really thrown uh, more light on that and uh, this is what so here everybody is observing in everyday life uh, so as I said uh, though I am a, a mathematician or uh, whatever the study or whatever this project uh, which spans across uh, last five years we have 2018 uh, our um, way of looking at the uh, things which are running around it changed and uh, we decided that okay education and environment uh, uh, they can be brought together and uh, um, fortunately it is going to benefit the society at large there is a blind bl plant blindness is also there so our very objective of the learning garden uh, setup was uh, uh, how we can involve all the uh, groups or all the categories of human beings, whether it, you are a city, senior citizen, uh, whether you are a middle-aged person or uh, whether it, uh, it is uh, there. Uh, so we are going to come out of with the outcome also. So here basically our thrust was on uh, transformation, transformative learning that from your own uh, humanhood or uh, uh, so to say because we belong to a women uh, scientist association uh, that uh, from that womanhood how we can uh, bring in uh, to the social and the other changes. So as, uh, as of now we everybody knows the objective of uh, sustainability education. So our thrust is learning through uh, the activity activity based uh, learning and uh, uh, as I said um, uh, because we are living in Mumbai every college or every institutions they may not be having that kind of facility uh, so why not create fortunately our is a uh, partially funded by government organizations and we have got a good uh, uh, place in right in the heart of the city that is at Vashi and there we started uh, designing uh, this kind of learning garden uh, so basically um, uh, our effort was uh, fostering the sustainability education through uh, garden based learning so these are the actual pictures taken where you will see uh, the toddlers also visit our learning garden and try to learn the things uh, through the game based learning and so on uh, so thanks to Vijaya she is basically an architect of uh, bringing in so many innovative ideas and so on so there was a curiosity and uh, creativity experiential learning everything was there and uh, it could touch so when we looked back uh, when I was introduced to my own uh, friend from climate reality, Dr. Nandini Deshmukh is present. So when I was introduced by her to the sustainability education, all the 17 goals, so it was to my great surprise that whatever we are doing, whatever the activities, all the 17 goals in some way or the other, they are uh, trying to uh, satisfy. Uh, so connecting the traditional wisdom with biodiversity conservation. So in Marathi, we always say that there is an Ajibai ka batwa and Ajibai uh, ka Batwa gives you the solution for everything. So we have started putting down the things one by one uh, and uh, we started documenting the things. Uh, so here we have conducted several uh, activities um, uh, tra uh, ranging from uh, training the trainers program where uh, our own USA members because all whenever you are working for an organization we would like to work in unison. Uh, because all should uh, think alike and uh, take uh, be participative 
and that is how we started training our own members then we started uh, training all the senior citizens middle age homemakers students and so on uh, so that is how uh, it is and unfortunately or fortunately i don't know but within those two years of corona because in this project from 2018 to 2022 that two uh, um, uh, one one and a half year they came into existence and uh, uh, our own uh, members they started taking part it and uh, as i said the all the student internship programs also we have conducted almost 10 colleges from mumbai uh, the students started taking part uh, uh, so all the activities ranging from nature walks tree identification know your pollinators and so on so that is how we started uh, taking part and as i said the transferative learning we have really practiced and this is one of the technique we uh, learned because of that so these are the collaborators and partnerships and so on uh, so this is how we started uh, going about it uh, so we felt that uh, gardening is futuristic as i said uh, uh, you can belong to any faculty whether uh, like as i said i belong to mathematics which has hardly any connections but then i used to teach uh, uh, whether it is a fibonacci sequence and so on how you can find out the mathematical patterns in the uh, nature and that is how i uh, we have started taking up so this is also the gardening is futuristic and these are the community engagements programs and workshops all these are uh, documented uh, uh, in the form of a booklets and so on and uh, that is how we have uh, self uh, told ourselves that it is a uh, call of action and we have practiced over and now the tradition is going to continue uh, so thanks to the uh, icsc platform and uh, the uh, uh, climate reality project foundation and plus the indian women scientists association uh, to give us so this is our next uh, thing is there uh, so may i request actually these are some outcomes so people always talk about the outcomes of and these are the books which have been uh, written by our own uh, internship students and that is how it is going to be and this is the book on uh, billets which have been already published and so on so from as i said uh, this is what the outcome of our this and one small request we i know i have uh, heard the bell and so on but this is what uh, as i said the uh, granny is uh, to daughters so this is uh, uh, with your kind permission i will call uh, the author one of the authors uh, which is so i would like to unravel with your auspicious hand sir so if you can so we have not yet published but this is going to be published so please come here <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we started with ecological grief. You know, we found children were very anxious, so we wanted to create hope. But hope without direction or any strategy is meaningless. So that is how we said, you know, how can we hand over a planet to children who do not have the know-how or the technology to take care? That is how we started the learning. Yeah. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Just one thing: how is it related? How is this book related to climate change? There is biodiversity. It shows how traditionally we have biodiversity on our palaces, on our trees, you know, trees. But to have that kind of biodiversity, you need biodiversity in the soil. And to, once you have biodiversity growing from Mother Earth, that is what mitigates climate change. <laughs> okay. This is conservation over hundreds of years because of the ancient wisdom right. these plants have been. Lovely. Right. Thank you so much. A wonderful end to the entire set of uh, presentations. Yes, yeah. My mother, this is for yours. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sure, sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Please. Yeah. Now we have come to an uh, come to an end of the poster presentation. We had very very interesting presentation. We were expecting 16, but uh, we had uh, 14 presentations, and it started from sustainability education to fire to uh, you know urban green space uh, to pollution you know sustainability five ways sustainability gender gen, uh, gender justice etc i think we had a very varied uh, uh, this thing topics uh, we had and uh, it was very very interesting so thank you all very much but uh, i know we have lot of uh, uh, questions for all this presentation but we have Uh, limited time so uh, we will uh, will not uh, this thing unless it is any uh, particular question you have for some 
uh, some presenter you can one or two we can but anything guys okay uh, thank you thank you very much and thank i thank right. my Hi, good afternoon everyone. First of all, congratulations to everyone who presented here and everyone else who is present here. And I'm sorry for being a little late uh, to the presentations. And wonderful list of presentations here. I myself am a academician and it's so lovely to see different, uh, you know, formats of the same thing that we're talking about which is sustainability at the end of the day from uh, looking into different sorts of methodologies be it ground based work or be it you know um, web research or be it introduction to the application of technologies like remote sensing and gis which is what one of the things that we teach our students is uh, it's so it's so beautiful to see that also to end it on a very nice note i think uh, the presentation that we had in the end was pretty motivating and inspiring as to how we can take help and inspiration from our ancient past and in incorporate all that into our daily lifestyle so yes thank you so much again and all the best so thank you so much uh, both of you have done my job much more easier I concur fully with all of you and uh, I guess we had a very interesting session. We'll certainly go, uh, you know, huddle up, yeah. have the marks together. Okay. That's good.